Um, so uh, this is our, our pie chart for actionable mutations in, uh, or driver mutations in lung adenocarcinoma. So the ones that I will focus on today, uh, like Corey mentioned, include the ALK translocations, which is about three to seven percent of the population. Um, and then uh, towards the end, we'll touch briefly on ROS1 and RET, and uh, Dr. Ali is going to uh, reveal some of the data on the um, other slices uh, of the pie. Uh, so many of you are aware that uh, the EML4 ALK fusion was originally characterized by, by Soda and colleagues, and this really defined a population of non-small cell lung cancer that, um, epid that demographically and clinically uh, had a, a different type of disease. Many of these patients tend to be younger. In the trials, about, some of the trials, up to 50% had a prior smoking history, but uh, in general, we think of it as a population that maybe doesn't have as heavy of a smoking history, and certainly many young patients with, um, who were never smokers uh, present with this disease. Uh, the initial diagnostic assay was the fish break-apart assay, uh, where you see a, a split signal because your probes are on the um, five prime and three prime end um, of, of the ALK. Now there is an immunohistochemistry-based assay, which is approved as well. And, and so testing in that sense um, hopefully has become a little bit easier um, since immunohistochemistry can also be done in, in individual centers. Um, these are the current available ALK inhibitors that I'll focus more on today. Um, and, and so to start with crizotinib, uh, the uh, initial ALK inhibitor, and, and crizotinib was actually originally developed as a MET inhibitor and, and then was known to have ALK, inhibit and, uh, ALK inhibitor activity. And so the initial phase one was enriched for a population of patients who had the ALK translocation. And at that time, with really nothing else for this disease, really sh resulted in dramatic, quick responses in a patient population who had limited treatment options. Uh, so the waterfall plot illustrates the activity with a response rate of 57%, stable disease of 33%. Um, and, uh, and I think just clinically uh, seeing patients with um, reversal of their symptoms in very short time frames. Uh, so first line and second line trials have been done. Uh, and in the second line trial, patients were randomized to crizotinib or chemotherapy, and that included either pemetrexid or docetaxel. And you could see the hazard ratio for pro uh, progression favored the crizotinib with a hazard ratio of 0.49. There was a suggestion that perhaps the group who got pemetrexid did a little bit better than docetaxel, and there are other reports as well, which which illustrates the um, activity of pemetrexid in this in this population. Um, and in the first line setting, uh, patients were randomized to either crizotinib or chemotherapy. And again, the uh, progression-free survival favored the crizotinib with a hazard ratio of 0.45. It's challenging to look at overall survival differences um, in this population with the ability of patients to receive uh, an ALK inhibitor um, as subsequent therapy. And this just gives an overview of the uh, f phase one data as well as the... the um, uh, first line, second line uh, data. And the response rates in general are fairly consistent at about 60%. For the treatment naive population uh, in, in profile 1014, the response rate was a little bit higher at 74%, and the PFS was a little bit higher at 10.9 months. But in general, under a year, uh, median uh, patients tend to have um, progression. And the 12 month survival probability uh, in profile 1014 was as high as 84% in, in that population. So seritinib was developed as a second generation ALK inhibitor and at the time there were limited uh, options for these patients uh, when they progressed on crizotinib. Uh, the preclinical studies indicated that it was a more potent ALK inhibitor than crizotinib and also had activity against some of the known resistance mutations including the gatekeeper mutation of 1196. Um, that did not that crizotinib did not have activity against. So the ascend one was a phase one dose escalation and then expansion study, which was also enriched for patients who had um, ALK positive 
uh, disease. Uh, there were a very small number of patients with other cancers who were initially treated, but predominantly this was a, a non-small cell lung cancer study. The MTD was determined to be 750 milligrams once a day. Uh, it was still at a fasting dose, and um, food effect studies have been slower in coming, and so the, um, this dose is really with a, with a fasting schedule. And as you can see, 163 patients had received a prior ALK inhibitor, predominantly crizotinib. 83 patients were ALK inhibitor naive. This is the demographic breakdown. In general, most patients had an ECOG performance status of, of one. Um, and again, about uh, maybe a little over half were never smokers. And the age range is variable, I and mean, the median is about 50, in the mid-50s, but you can see patients were as young as 20, 22, and as old as 80. And not surprisingly, most of them had adenocarcinoma. So the response rates from the initial data show the response rates about 53% in the ALK inhibitor uh, previously treated group, 65% in the ALK inhibitor naive group. And the waterfall plot also illustrates that, that activity, which, you know, I think Corey alluded to this earlier, at the time, uh, this was one of the, the first illustrations of a second generation drug being able to salvage um, a resistant population um, for some of these driver mutations. What um, has been clear now is that for patients who were ALK inhibitor naive, there was a higher median PFS, uh, which is about 18 months compared to 7.39 months in, in patients who um, were previously treated. Uh, and so I think this is a trend that we're appreciating it with some of the other agents I'll discuss um, with perhaps a duration of activity that could be longer in, in a less heavily treated population. Um, Seritinib is known for um, some of the toxicities that emerged out of this trial and about 60% of patients had at least one dose reduction. Uh, in general, the, the more common toxicities include GI toxicities like nausea, um, vomiting, and, and diarrhea. And in contrast to crizotinib, where we often didn't have to uh, counsel patients as aggressively before starting, I think the experience with seritinib is that you do need to have a discussion about the potential for these toxicities and make sure they have antiemetics and antidiarrheal agents at home. Um, and the hope is that some of the food effect data uh, may help improve the toxicity profile as it did with crizotinib. So this is an overview of the um, responses seen with seritinib, and again, um, in general consistent around a 56% range. Um, the uh, ASCEND-3 trial was... Um, uh, or rather, as you can see here, we I split up the ASCEND-1 into the treatment naive and the previously treated group. And in the treatment naive group, the median PFS was about 18.4 um, months. So alexinib is another agent which is now available. And this also has, uh, again, potent preclinical uh, ALK inhibition activity. And in the, the original uh, study, you can see that the waterfall plot showed dramatic response rates and even uh, seven patients who had complete responses. Uh, the other thing that's been notable for many of the second generation ALK inhibitors is the ability to penetrate the CNS. And this was appreciated with both seritinib and, and electinib. Um, and this is especially important in this patient population because they are known to have a, a predisposition to CNS metastases. Much of the time, it may be small, um, asymptomatic metastases, but that gave an opportunity on the trials for patients who had asymptomatic disease to be treated with these TKIs without having uh, CNS radiation and helped allow everyone to see the ability of these agents to, to treat um, these, these sites of disease. Uh, so um, moving on with electinib, the dose that was originally studied in the Japanese study is different from the dose with the North American data. And in the trial that was done here, 47 patients were treated. All of them had prior crizotinib, and the response rate was 55%, and the CNS response rate was 52%. Uh, Dr. U uh, did a global phase two study where he further studied the role of electinib. Uh, 
And in this trial, uh, patients were treated at a dose of 600 milligrams twice a day. And you can see the response rate was 61%. Um, and in patients who were chemotherapy naive, about 69%. And this illustrates that activity again in the waterfall plot. Uh, and again, going back to the CNS metastases, uh, CNS activity was actually somewhat similar with response rates of uh, 50, 57% in patients with measurable CNS disease. And, and this was the case even regardless of prior radiation. So this is the toxicity profile of electinib. Um, with this agent, there were uh, really not that much appreciable grade three or four toxicities. Much of it's grade one and two. Um, and uh, the percentage of some of the GI toxicities uh, was fairly low, like 7% for diarrhea. Uh, what I think I, I have seen is transaminitis, and that was reported here as well, again, grade one, 9%. So a uh, phase three trial um, has, has been ongoing to address the question of the first line uh, role of a more potent uh, ALK inhibitor versus crizotinib. And what we have now to, to look at is the Japanese uh, ALEC study, which is a phase three trial in that population to look at this question. And again, the dose is a, a little different with 300 milligrams BID. This was just reported at ASCO. Um, in this population, I think it's notable that patients who had uh, brain metastases, again, were included and were fairly balanced across um, both arms. Uh, there were patients who had no lines of prior chemotherapy. Up to a third had one prior um, uh, chemotherapy. And the ALK testing was done with both um, IHC uh, and FISH or um, RT-PCR. So this is the primary endpoint, which is progression-free survival, which you can see uh, favored electinib in this setting with a hazard ratio of 0.34. And uh, again, in looking at the subgroup analyses, there was um, activity across groups of patients who had prior chemotherapy, clinical stage, uh, smoking status, and also those who had brain metastases at baseline. And in looking at the toxicity profile, about 8.7% uh, of the patients on electinib had an AE leading to discontinuation of the study drug in contrast to crizotinib. Um, it's a little bit higher than what was reported in profile 1014. In that study, the discontinu discontinuation rate of crizotinib was 12%. And this illustrates the toxicities that were on, on this study. Um, there was a percentage of patients on both arms, about 8%, who had interstitial lung disease. And this has been noted with other ALK inhibitors as well and is likely a, a class effect. So was the effect, efficacy of crizotinib as expected? Um, so in profile 1014, the response rate was 74%, and the PFS was 10.9 months. Uh, in this study, it was a response rate of 78.9%, PFS 10.2 months. So in that sense, that was, that was similar. So brigatinib is another second-generation ALK inhibitor that's been in development. I think corey has been involved with this since, um, since the early days. Uh, the development of this trial, of this agent, was initially, I think, impacted because of um, the awareness that there was a, a, a number of patients who had sudden pulmonary toxicities, which was a little distinct from the pneumonitis that we know is a class effect of this agent. And so this required, um, I think, further evaluation at lower doses. So this trial randomized patients to either a lower dose of brigatinib of 90 milligrams versus 180 milligrams. And again, responses were seen at both dose levels, 45% in the lower dose and 54% at the 180 milligram dose. And CNS responses were noticed as well, again, a little bit higher at the higher dose. Uh, 
Um, so this illustrates some of the uh, data in aggregate of serotonin, electinib, and brigatinib. You can see response rates, especially in patients who were uh, previously treated, were similar. CNS responses that were reported um, uh, are listed for all agents. Uh, it's important to realize that the CNS activity wasn't necessarily uh, an endpoint in the design of all of these trials initially, but as it was clear there was activity um, uh, the, the data was, was evaluated retrospectively. Uh, and again, the median PFS in these uh, series um, are listed here as well, which varies uh, a little bit across studies, but I think also depends on prior treatment. And, and this also illustrates the toxicity across all three of these agents. Um, in addition to the pulmonary AE seen in 6%, brigatinib uh, has also been known to cause some degree of diarrhea, nausea, and also hypertension. I'm just going to skip ahead. So lorlatinib is, I think, the third generation inhibitor, which is currently in trials. And this is notable for having activity against some of the known acquired resistance mutations, and in particular, um, the G12 O2 uh, resistance mutation, which we now know confers resistance to um, some of the first and second generation ALK inhibitors. Um, and uh, in addition, uh, there's, uh, you can see activity against other, other resistance uh, mutations as well. So uh, Dr. Solomon had reported the results of the phase one study. And in that trial, uh, the, the final MTD was determined to be 100 milligrams a day. Uh, you can see the adverse event profile here is very distinct from the prior ALK inhibitors. So on this agent, patients may develop uh, hypercholesteremia to the degree where they would need to be placed on uh, lipid-lowering agents. And um, also peripheral neuropathy, uh, there's um, awareness of possible CNS effects. This drug does have quite good CNS penetration, um, but a possible implication of that is, is more um, cognitive uh, CNS effects. I think it's unclear right now what the degree of that is, but it's something that's being evaluated on the clinical trials. So the, the patients who were previously treated, um, you can see our color-coded here. But of this initial data uh, with these small numbers, there is activity of this agent. And again, um, many of these patients had two or more prior tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So that's compelling to know that there's another possible uh, third-line agent for, the, for this population. Uh, the, P, the median PFS was 11.4 months. And the, Percentage of 18-month progression-free survival was 23%. And if you break it down by prior therapy, slightly favored the, the less heavily treated population. So we're learning more about the acquired resistance mutations. And I think this is going to be more important as we have to sort through the available um, ALK inhibitor options, uh, especially in the uh, second-line setting. Um, so as I mentioned before, the 1196 is a gatekeeper mutation. Uh, 1202 has been characterized in this series in about 17% of patients. Um, and overall, in, in this series that was done by McCoach and colleagues, about one-third of the treated tumors they had tested had a kinase domain resistance mutation. This table illustrates the potential activity of all of these options depending on the resistance mutation. And you can see um, some, for instance, the 1171 conferred resistance to electinib, but sensitivity to seritinib. Uh, 1202 conferred sensitivity to lorlatinib, resistance to the others. Um, 1174 conferred resistance to seritinib, but sensitivity to electinib. And I, I think uh, you know the practicality of, of repeat biopsies will have to be uh, considered on a case-by-case -case basis, but as there are more uh, tools to look at circulating um, DNA and, and um, blood-based assays, uh, this may be more relevant to us to be able to uh, determine if there are resistance mutations, especially when making treatment decisions at the time of progression. 
Uh, so uh, briefly to ROS1, crizotinib has ROS1 activity as well. Uh, in this uh, series, 50 patients were treated with response rates of 72%. Uh, we still have a lot to learn about resistance. Um, there are a, a couple resistance mutations which have been characterized for ROS1, lorlatinib, which I um, showed the phase one data in the, in the phase two trial has an arm specifically for ROS1. Um, and so th this is a small percentage of patients, but um, certainly there's uh, opportunity to, to study mechanisms of resistance as they progress on crizotinib. Uh, RET rearrangements is another rare event which has been appreciated in some patients, and uh, Alexander Drillon presented a phase two study of cabozantinib in this population. You can see there are multiple possible partners, uh, but the most common is KIFFB. Uh, it's only one to two percent of lung cancers. Uh, they also may be younger or never or, or former light smokers, uh, and again, more commonly in adenocarcinoma. So in his study, uh, up to a third of patients had two or more lines of therapy, about half had prior bevacizumab, uh, and you can see the breakdown of the different types of uh, fusion um, partners uh, in, in the table. Uh, in the small series, there were responses ap appreciated. It was a 44% response rate, 58% stable disease. The overall response rate was 38%. Um, I think I sent him a patient. I actually sent him a patient who I inherited from Corey, <laughs> who ended up years later, we did learn that um, she had a RET translocation. And she was such a heavily treated patient population. She had some pet response, but not really appreciable resist measurable um, responses. So it made me wonder if the degree of um, you know prior therapies could possibly impact some of these results. Um, and, and in the profiling he did, he did, he did a nice analysis of uh, how the molecular features um, corresponded to, to the activity. So, um, you know, it, it, it's a challenge with these uh, more rare populations to design trials with sufficient numbers of paper, pa patients to study all of the potential resistant mechanisms. I think for ALK positive disease, one thing that's clear is that um, the treatment landscape is more complex than it was, you know, three to four years ago. There are more options, and with the potential of some of the um, second generation inhibitors, and in particular, electinib having first line, uh, first line data in Japan, and you know, um, we await the results for for um, the Western population, uh, this will probably impact our choices in the second line setting, um, which we'll have to learn how to appreciate. But I think understanding the resistance mutations will be more important um, as we um, make decisions for our patients at that time. And the brain metastases is still a critical issue. I've had many patients who've had wonderful systemic control of their disease and eventually continue to progress in the brain. And as we cycle them through all of the available ALK inhibitor options, um, that's often where um, you know, we, we have a harder time controlling their disease.